Hi, I'm Dr. Rebecca Woods. I'm one of the uh, epileptologists uh, with the Norton Neuroscience Institute. Um, an epileptologist is a fancy word for people who, neurologists who specialize in epilepsy. And I have a particular interest in uh, epilepsy in women and how it affects them over their lifespan. Um, so it's my pleasure to be able to talk about that today and take questions at the end. Um, Women and women's issues in epilepsy are uh, different than men. Um, there are multiple issues which can affect an entire lifetime. Um, these often begin at puberty, um, which is often when some seizures begin, uh, particularly genetic epilepsy. Um, that brings a host of issues because of hormonal issues. And hormonal changes begin with the menstrual cycle. Um, they can lead to increased seizures around uh, periods, which uh, we call catamenial epilepsy. Um, it's oftentimes when women start on birth control, which also can impact patients with seizures. Um, and puberty in and of itself doesn't cause epilepsy, but patients who have a tendency to have seizures or who have epilepsy um, will often begin having more problems at puberty. Um, this is when we like to start talking about pregnancy prevention in patients who are already on seizure medications and how to plan how to prevent unwanted pregnancies. Um, into the young adult phase, this is uh, something that can affect fertility. Um, it also poses some issues for preconceptual planning. Um, during pregnancy, we have to make special modifications during seizure manage uh, during seizure medication management and monitoring, and talking about birth defects and uh, care with your GYN. In the postpartum phase, we have to monitor a little more carefully and talk about breastfeeding and how that is impacted by seizure medications and talking about postmenopausal issues, which actually we begin talking about in young adulthood or even uh, adolescence and how we prevent issues uh, postmenopausal. So we'll talk about each of those things a little bit more. Um, in puberty, there are hormonal changes that begin with the menstrual cycle. There, uh, oftentimes there's a term thrown around catamenial epilepsy. Oops, sorry. And catamenial epilepsy typically refers to people who only have seizures during their period. Uh, most of our patients will have seizures that are worse around their menstrual cycle. Um, and that oftentimes will be documented as catamenial epilepsy. Um, at the onset of puberty for people with refractory epilepsy or any patient really, um, there's often introduction of oral contraceptive pills and those medications can have an impact on seizure medications and we start talking about um, preventing unwanted, unplanned pregnancies or undesired pregnancies, especially in the setting of someone who has epilepsy and is on medications that we may need to change or monitor. So what does, what do hormones do during um, seizures? So estrogen has been well documented and estrogen is the hormone that is highest at ovulation. It starts to fall very shortly after ovulation um, when you release an egg. So about two weeks after your period starts um, is when we expect ovulation to begin. Um, that varies on what day that seems like from person to person, but from the day of your period onset until 14 days is the hot estrogen phase. Um, following that, there is a decrease in estrogen and an increase in progesterone. Um, Estrogen has been shown to be a pro-convulsant, meaning it can cause seizures in rats. It actually can cause status epilepticus, which we, we aren't rats, thankfully. Um, but it increases the excitability or irritability of your brain, especially if you already have seizures, making it easier to have one. Um, in pre-puberty states, the effects are overall uh, across the part of the brain, and then they can potentially affect specific parts of the brain, and we won't get into those details, they're less relevant. Um, the other female hormone that is very important for us is progesterone, and it actually decreases um, all of that irritability in the brain and 
raises the seizure threshold, which is actually a good thing. It makes it a little more difficult to have a seizure. So there are definitely states during um, a menstrual cycle where patients do much better and uh, other phases in life and certain birth controls. So in people with catamenial epilepsy, we see that surge here around day 14 of the menstrual cycle. Um, then there's the next phase is called mid-luteal, which is where everything's kind of cooking, waiting for a baby. And if there's not one, then progesterone starts to tank and you have a period around day 28 and that varies from person to person. I'm going to skip that slide. Um, so what does that mean for patients, for women who are trying to regulate out hormonal changes with seizures? Um, what we know is that progesterone actually has been helpful for a large group of patients. And there have been some placebo controlled uh, studies where patients with a higher rate of seizures around their period do much better on progesterone therapy. Um, let me go back to that. For most people, that means um, Depo-Provera or um, a higher progesterone birth control. Um, some people, especially eliminating a period altogether for people who are having fluctuations around their menstrual cycle, um, eliminating any fluctuations in estrogen and progesterone by either continuous birth control or Depo-Provera has been shown to be very effective for people who have a fluctuation around their period. Um, other birth controls we'll talk about just a little bit, um, such as oral contraceptives, but that'll come in. Um, one of the biggest things that I am asked or that I start talking about once a patient transitions to me who is in the phase of life where they could have a pregnancy is pregnancy planning for women of any reproductive phase. And um, we talked about hormonal influences on seizures that we talked about already. The number one thing I ask my patients is to plan their pregnancies that we want to know how we optimize medications pre-pregnancy, we want them stable, we want you not having seizures, and we want the safest and most effective medications on board before a pregnancy. Um, the other thing I talk about a lot uh, is folic acid supplementation. I like for that in all my patients. So as soon as my patients have a period, I start them on folic acid. And there are a number of reasons for that. Number one being reduction in risk of birth defects. Um, and we'll talk about those uh, in a moment. The other thing is to notify at any point contraception changes because that can affect seizure medications and also notifying as soon as you know that you're pregnant so that if it wasn't a planned pregnancy, we can make changes right away in um, how we're managing if we have to, we prefer not to change anything um, that we, if there's something we need to do, we will do it then. Um, and we like for calcium supplementation and for most of our patients, we ask that really from the time that we start a seizure medication, uh, good calcium supplementation and getting vitamin D. Um, so oral contraceptive, contraceptives and epilepsy are quite complicated. Um, most women are on an oral contraceptive and or the pill as a means of birth control or regulating periods. Um, they can help with mood. There are a number of reasons that oral contraceptives are great medications. Um, most are a combination of estrogen and progesterone. And these work together to control bleeding and prevent ovulation. Seizure medications or AEDs, as you'll see written here, have interactions with oral contraceptives. Um, the ones that typically do that are medications like trileptol or oxcarbazepine, tegretol or carbamazepine, dilantinorphinitoin, and phenobarbital. There are a few others that are impacted by um, seizure medications as well. And what actually happens is that the medications make the birth control less effective and the birth control actually makes the levels go down of the seizure medication. So 
Generally, we ask that patients who are on medications like that um, to be on a higher dose birth control, a higher dose of estrogen under birth control, and then we monitor their seizure medications to see if we need to adjust that. So it doesn't mean that oral contraceptives are bad, um, but it just means we have to be a little more careful and cautious and having open discussions about those. So this is kind of just a list of medications that can cause problems with seizure medication. So the ones that decrease your birth control concentration, not your own estrogen concentration. So the estrogen you make on your own is not altered at all by seizure medications, but the estrogen you take externally can be altered by carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine or trileptol, phenobarbital, phenytoin, Primidone, which is very similar to phenobarbital, topiramate. Um, there are a few that may alter it a little, but not dramatically. Most of the medications that we're using more commonly in women are not altered at all by um, seizure medications. However, some oral contraceptives can alter the seizure medication as well, like lamotrigine. So we normally have to increase that dose pretty significantly on certain birth, birth controls. Um, so a few things about these medications is, we already talked about taking a higher estrogen and relatively high progestin content or birth control or not a mini pill. Um, progesterone only contraceptives contain very low doses of progesterone. We don't, we don't recommend those. Um, if someone's unable to tolerate estrogen or there's a contraindication to estrogen, normally we ask that people get a Depo-Provera shot. It's more effective. It seems to not be, um, there's less chance of failure and there's less interaction. And when people have breakthrough bleeding, this is an important point. Breakthrough bleeding is not an, a marker necessarily that your birth control has failed. It's also not a marker that your medications have um, changed anything. So breakthrough bleeding on oral contraceptives is pretty common. Um, this would take a, a good discussion with your epileptologist and your gynecologist to determine what the best course of action would be if there's continued breakthrough bleeding on birth control pills. Um, all systemic hormone met methods of birth control are subject to the same properties as birth control. However, ones that act locally or long acting like the depo are um, better choices for contraception. We often recommend an IUD, which is not permanent, but it is a long-term treatment uh, for birth control. So what I generally ask patients is if they're not going to have a pregnancy within the next two years or so that they consider an IUD. It takes out the effect of changes on your seizure medications or changes on your birth control on the hormonal effect because IUDs act locally. Um, we always ask patients to engage their gynecologist in these discussions, but these are what we generally recommend is an IUD or long acting medications like the Depo-Provera shot that you go in every three months to have. So why, why do we harp on folic acid in women? Um, doses of folic acid preconceptually, meaning before you have a pregnancy, generally in the six months prior, reduce the risk of major malformation, major congenital malformations. Um, there have been a number of studies that have been shown this, that people who have not been on folic acid have a lower folic acid level and that the there was an increased risk of structural abnormalities in babies who um, are born to mothers with lower folic acid doses. Most commonly that people will hear is uh, spina bifida. What we see probably more commonly now that the FDA has mandated that all foods that can be supplemented with folic acid are is midline structural defects. Um, the trend is more for taking those to reduce those risks. And by midline structural defects, I'm not sure if this is in the next slide, I can't recall what I took out, um, are things like 
cleft lip and cleft palate, which are considered cosmetic, but can be very significant, uh, decreased ability to feed appropriately and breathing issues. Um, they definitely come with surgical risks. Uh, cardiac defects, which the heart starts kind of in line and then moves outward, genital urinary defects, and very rarely some seizure medications can cause limb defects. We try not to ever use those in women with seizures. There is no known risk of taking folic acid even at a high dose. And it's important to know that what is in your prenatal vitamin is not enough folic acid to make us comfortable from an epilepsy standpoint to reduce those risks of major fetal malformations or minor fetal malformations. And so how much is enough? Um, in general, whether you have epilepsy or not, one milligram daily is recommended for all women of childbearing age. And that generally is what is in a prenatal vitamin. The exact dosing is unclear. There have been studies all over the board. They're generally small, showing four milligrams, six milligrams, two milligrams. Um, and whether or not there's a huge difference in those is really difficult to determine. Our general practice and most epileptologists practice uh, with four milligrams plus your prenatal vitamin and then anything you get from diet. And um, when we talk to patients who are not thinking about conceiving, one milligram of folic acid might be okay and cheaper, but the number of unplanned pregnancies or unexpected pregnancies are fairly high. Not everyone is able to perfectly plan that. So my practice is to continue on four milligrams if it's tolerated from a gastrointestinal standpoint, and it generally is the cheap vitamin. Um, so moving on to other issues that occur in patients with epilepsy um, in their most active years is that sexual dysfunction and sexual disorders are very common in patients with epilepsy, both men and women. 30% to 60% of patients with seizure disorders or epilepsy have decreased desire or decreased arousal or decreased ability to achieve uh, orgasm. And these are important things to be able to talk about with your doctor. The reason for this is believed to be multiple things. Um, it can be really related to decreased hormone levels and how seizures impact the middle parts of the brain that help control that. It can be from seizure medication side effects, and it can be from things like anxiety and depression, which are incredibly common in patients with epilepsy. Um, a study in 20, 2005 showed that patients who had um, Epilepsy had a significant increased sexual dysfunction when compared to people without epilepsy. And the dysfunctions present, whether you have partial seizures or focal onset, or you have a generalized onset epilepsy, like juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. The treatment of that, it really needs to be discussed comprehensively in clinic. You need to be comfortable with your provider and being able to talk about what phase of that is happening. Ideally, we want excellent seizure control, and in patients with good seizure control, generally that reduces that risk. Um, if it's believed to be from the medication, changing medication to another seizure medication is something that we do very cautiously and carefully because if someone's well controlled, we don't want to lose seizure control. Um, but if it's possible, we will change medication if that if that seems appropriate, and then maybe. Probably the number one thing that, that I see in our clinic is treating the depression um, or anxiety, and that generally resolves the majority of the issues for most patients. Good control, good treatment of anxiety and depression, and then looking at medications as a third line. Medications such as uh, a brand name for Viagra or other medications like that. And women have not been shown to be effective um, in some studies in postmenopausal women. And we would presume that that would carry for all patients with all women, that it's just not an effective medication for women. So does epilepsy affect fertility? Um, and the, the short answer is yes. Um, the epilepsy itself uh, has this in the hormonal aspect that impacts um, 
reproduction, it can cause problems with the pituitary axis and then subsequent hormonal treatment issues. Some seizure medications can cause things like polycystic ovarian syndrome as well. And then there are patients that we don't know why they have infertility. So there is an increased risk of that in patients with epilepsy. Generally, again, people who are well controlled have less issues. So our goal is always good control. Um, we've gone over most of this. This uh, really talking about valproic acid is probably the most important drug to talk about here as far as sex hormones and seizure medications. Um, valproic acid is uh, kind of a nasty medication as far as causing in women. It's a good medication. Um, so if you need it, you need it. Um, if we can avoid it, we want to avoid it. It can cause polycystic ovarian syndrome, increased testosterone levels, and other male sex hormones, which then lead to acne, hair growth that you don't want. And it's one of the most common endocrine abnormalities in women is polycystic ovarian syndrome. So newer seizure medications and their effect on the endocrine system, including how they affect uh, sexual arousal, desire, and fertility is that we don't really know yet. There's not great information. So I think if you start a new medication and you begin having problems, it's most important to talk to your provider. Um, the exception being medications that can cause significant weight gain like gabapentin and that can weight gain itself increases your risk of polycystic ovarian syndrome or pcos so we already talked about fertility rates in women in men there is sometimes loss of libido or desire sometimes there's uh, problems with maintaining or achieving an erection and infertility most prominently with medication called Depakote, which can decrease sperm count or cause a zero sperm count. So in men who are suffering from infertility, um, we do the same kind of workup and see what we can do as far as helping them from that standpoint. So talking about pregnancy, more than 50% of all pregnancies across the board, whether you have epilepsy or not, are unplanned, which is why I continue high dose folic acid supplementation. The number of my patients who have told me I'm never having a baby who come in and have a baby um, are pretty high. And I tease them all the time. And I'm like, thank goodness you're taking your folic acid. And we talk about it every visit that we can um, about planning pregnancies. 90% of women with epilepsy have normal healthy children which is a, not a significant deviation from people without epilepsy and who are on their medications so what does pregnancy look like for women with epilepsy for the vast majority it doesn't look any different than a pregnancy for anybody else um, if we plan things we've gotten medications that well adjusted people are under good control um, then normally the pregnancy goes off without a hitch. Pregnancy having being a high progesterone state also then gives you some protection against seizures during that time. So when I trained, we used to say 30% of women do about the same, 30% do worse, 30% are unchanged or, or better during pregnancy. And I think, really think that the majority of women now are better during pregnancy. Um, and especially if we've been able to fine tune things leading up into a pregnancy. So in there are about 20,000 pregnancies per year in women with epilepsy. Um, it's one of the most common reasons for seizures during pregnancy and not preeclampsia. We do have to continue your medications during pregnancy. Their number one thing, if I can stress anything, no matter how scared you are about seizure medications during pregnancy, those are discussions to have long before, but no matter how afraid you are, do not stop medications during pregnancy. Seizures are much more dangerous than continuing your medication that alert your neurologist right away um, that you are pregnant and that you want to come in and talk about it if you've not already done so. And that leads to where we have to balance the slight increased risk of birth defects versus the risk of severe seizures, even on some of the medications that we know have a slight higher risk than others um, during pregnancy. What we want at the end is a healthy mom and a healthy baby. We don't get a healthy baby if mom is not healthy during the pregnancy. 
Um, I often tell my patients that you're growing parasite and parasites don't live if you aren't healthy. So the host has to be healthy. Um, my children resent me for calling them a parasite, but that's the absolute truth. Um, most women have uncomplicated pregnancies. They can have a normal vaginal delivery if they wish. And um, we do monitor a little more closely, but most of my patients really don't have um, not many more appointments than anyone else. I try to coordinate labs or things like that with when they see their gynecologist so that we can combine everything all at one time. And if I feel like they need to see a high risk OB, their gynecologist feels like that, or the patient wants to see a high risk OB, we can always refer to them um, for a consultation. So we already talked about this. So someone will have an increased risk of seizures during pregnancy. It's not very common. Most of the time it's because we've not been able to monitor seizure medications that change during pregnancy. So there are some seizure medications that absolutely tank in their blood levels during pregnancy. That does not mean they're bad medications or bad for pregnancy. In fact, two of the ones that I like the most for pregnancy are two of the ones that we have to monitor most closely. And that's fairly easy to do. We draw a blood level at the beginning of pregnancy or before and we draw a blood level in the second trimester and then adjust as needed. Um, it is very common for those two medications in particular to have to go up during pregnancy, meaning that the, your dose goes up, but baby and you are not getting exposed to higher levels of the medication. I can't stress that enough. And the best predictor really is how you did prior to pregnancy. Um, seizure frequency is very unpredictable between one pregnancy and another. I have patients who had zero pregnancy, like zero seizures during one pregnancy and have a lot during another, but that's fairly uncommon. So the risk of um, congenital malformations uh, during those pregnancies, they vary. Um, some actually are higher in family history of congenital malformations or birth defects. And um, the most well-known is, as I mentioned, cleft lip. Um, that's why we like to have those medications on beforehand because that all closes in the first trimester in the first six to eight weeks of pregnancy. The incidence of that is five to 10% in the general population. It's about 15% of babies born to women with epilepsy. And that doesn't account for which medication you're taking. That is just a pool of every medication and every woman with epilepsy. Um, so it does vary a little bit, like very likely by what medication you're taking. Um, overall, there's no best medication for pregnancy. The best medication is what controls you the best. Um, having said that, if I'm starting someone who I know is going to plan a pregnancy in the near future, I will start them on either trileptol, I mean, I'm sorry, Lamictal or Lamotrigine or Keppra or Levotriacetam. Those are the best choices during pregnancy. Those are medications that we have to monitor very carefully because they do go down in the second and third trimester, but those are my preferences if we can get to those, but those aren't always effective. Medications we try to avoid, Depakote and uh, Phenobarbital, they have the highest rate of congenital malformations along with Dilantin or Phenytoin, Carbamazepine or, or Tegretol and Topiramate. Um, the rest of them fall in category C, meaning that there's adverse effects in animals, um, but there's no human studies. So where do we get our data on deciding this? Um, there are pregnancy registries that are run by different companies there, but the one that we generally take our information from is the Mass General Pregnancy Registry, um, where patients voluntarily call in because we can't do studies in pregnant women. And they call in once they're pregnant. It's a very short intake. It's an then they call you in the second and third trimester very briefly um, to talk to you. And then we get good information out of that after there are enough exposures. Um, I did this myself as a control during my pregnancies because they have to have someone to compare it to. And it was not intrusive. And I encourage everyone who's pregnant to, to please enroll into the, the pregnancy registry. Um, as we talked about Lamictal's safe during pregnancy, but we do have to chase it a little bit. Levels bounce around, especially in the um, second and third trimesters. And then 
it, the levels do go up postpartum because those hormones are gone or coming down. But having said that, majority of our patients don't have toxicity and prefer to stay at a little bit higher dose because they want to protect themselves a little bit more during that period where they're incredibly sleep deprived with a new baby. So that's a very personal decision we make once baby is born. Publications for delivery during pregnancy, um, there's no substantial increased risk um, of C-section, late pregnancy bleeding, or premature labor. It's possible, but the best evidence is that there's no clear risk. There's insufficient evidence, meaning there's no clear evidence to support that there's an increased risk of um, a miscarriage or pregnancy-related hypertension or other pregnancy complications. So most people go through pregnancy just like anyone else. Is there a risk of hemorrhage in newborns? So there are certain seizure medications that deplete vitamin K. And in babies who do not receive vitamin K upon delivery, there is a risk of increased risk of hemorrhage, especially intracerebral in their brain. We all want our baby's brains protected. Um, so every baby in the U.S. gets vitamin K as soon as they are born as just part of routine practice. It is not just for women with epilepsy, but every baby gets a dose of vitamin K. Um, there are many other reasons that can have, you know, that you need that. So every baby gets vitamin K because it's not been shown to be harmful. Cognitive outcomes, there's no increased risk of reduced cognition in newborns uh, of women with epilepsy. Um, given that there are some that may increase the risk of some cognitive problems, uh, such as Dilantin, phenobarbital, and Depakote, and those are medications we're trying to avoid during pregnancy anyway. What we know about cognitive outcomes is that one medication is better than multiple medications. However, seizure control is always better than being uncontrolled. Um, Women with epilepsy taking any seizure medications are at risk for a slightly smaller baby, but there's no increase of death in the newborn period. Um, APGAR scores can be under seven at one minute, but that's not considered to be a significant um, issue if they come up at, at five minutes. And one of my favorite things is to breastfeed or not to breastfeed. Um, this often runs into a lot of trouble for people who are taking advice from other, from uneducated or undereducated, um, well-meaning people. Women with epilepsy can breastfeed and the American Academy of Pediatrics has shown and made recommendations over years, time and time again, that the benefits the, are far outweigh the risk of breastfeeding on seizure medication. So, Breastfeeding has been shown to have nutritional, um, immunological, and cognitive and developmental benefits um, for the baby, reduced risk of respiratory infections, reduced risk of GI issues in premature babies. Do seizure medications come through breast milk? Yes. Yeah. So um, the one, there are some that are excreted more highly in breast milk. Um, there are some that are excreted less, but in general, babies are getting 1.3 to 8% of what mom is taking, which is not a significant dose. And what I remind my patients is a lot of these medications have been, uh, they've been exposed in utero. That's a very small dose. We treat babies with these medications. So those doses are not, that, that percentage is not significant. 